Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest Locked On Bearcats live room. I'm Alex Frank, the host of Locked On Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ Heltman, my colleague from All Bearcats and Sports Illustrated, going to join me here in a matter of moments as we get you set for the Bearcats and Wichita State tomorrow night. We get you set with the latest news surrounding the offensive coordinator role uh, at Cincinnati. Todd Manning named the new offensive coordinator for the University of Cincinnati. Have I been saying Todd and it's really Tom? If so, that would be a major mishap on my part. Uh, anyway. Hmm, okay. Um, anyway, um, so lots to get to today. We'll look back on the Bearcats' performance at Temple last week. I was not very pleased with it, as I'm sure you were not as well. Russ had some things to say about that. We'll get to that. Um, so much to get to today surrounding Todd Manning, Josh Stepp, um, Greg Gasparato, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but anyway... Uh, it's been a good morning. Uh, it's been a good week here in Lockdown Bearcats. Um, happy New Year to those of you joining us today. I'm very happy that you all have taken time out of your Wednesday afternoon, whether you're at work, whether you're at, I don't know, you're still on vacation. Um, I, I, I first ask you this, to please keep, continue to keep DeMar Hamlin and your thoughts and prayers a very, very scary situation on Monday night at Paycor Stadium in Cincinnati. I was there. Russ was watching it. He he writes for all Bengals. We'll talk about that towards the end of today's show. Um, oh, and speaking of my friend and colleague, Russ, uh, Russ, I, I took lunch hour too literally today. So look at this. And I don't know those, I don't know, Russ, if you've heard of this place or if those of you listening have heard of this place. So Russ, we've got here some, what we got? We've got a Dorothy Lane Market. We've got some chicken tenders, some honey mustard, and then you've got and this is good stuff. Okay, you got some fried rice and some green beans. So you got you got your uh, your meat, you've got your your, your greens, and you've got your um, whatever you call it, fried rice. Russ, this is how we make sausage, as you always say. Yeah, that looks like a nice Macon feast right there. Are you in Macon right now? I am actually uh, at my. Uh, my mom's house in Dayton, Ohio. So I'm home for the week. Um, the, sa- the South so came up North with Alex. It did. It, it did. <laughs> I listen, I am now well-rounded in my culture. We're losing viewers. So I should shut up about lunch hour and get to today's episode. There's too much Bearcats lockdown. news to talk about lunch, Alex. Yeah, exactly. So forget about that. Thanks for uh, keeping it here on Locked On Bearcats. You are Locked On Bearcats. Your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, there is a lot of Bearcats news to get to today. He's Russ Heltman, my colleague at All Bearcats and Sports Illustrated. Let me uh, put our names up there so you can see. I'm Alex Frank, the host of Locked On Bearcats, your host. Each and every day. Um, Russ, it was a busy morning this morning. Um, So it's great that because I just posted today's show and now we've got our viewers here in the live room. So let's get right to it. Bearcats name a new offensive coordinator. You wrote about it earlier today. I talked about earlier today. What can you tell our listeners, Russ? Tom Manning comes over from uh, Iowa State and is a guy that's had a lot of good experience with the Cyclones over the past few years has been their offensive coordinator kind of off and on and different position coaching roles off and on but been there off the coordinator since 2019 has been with the Iowa State program followed his buddy Matt Campbell over there from Toledo was the offensive line coach for the um, for the Rockets in 2012 to 2015 then went and became the O-line offensive coordinator at Iowa State in 2016 left in 2018 to be a part of Frank Reich's first year on the job uh, in Indianapolis in 2018, and then came back as running backs coach, tight end coach, and then just defined offensive coordinator last season. And I think a lot of fans are upset with this hire right now because they're kind of just looking on the surface. They're seeing 
about 20 points per game in 2022, bottom 25 scoring offense in the country, really, really bad results. But that's in a year where you have to replace one of the greatest running backs in the history of the program in Brees Hall, which Tom Manning had a hand in recruiting him, and one of the greatest quarterbacks in all t- of all time in Iowa State history, Bryce Purdy, another player where Tom Manning had a hand in recruiting him. So I think this is me, a solid hire. He has a really great track record of building strong rushing attacks. The team, obviously, this year was around 80th in underlying analytics metrics in terms of efficiency, as opposed to just the flat looking at the points per game. On I think they were ranked 114th overall in scoring FBS-wise this season, so somewhere in that range in the one teens. So I think it was a little bit better under the surface than what we saw just scrolling through stats in 2022. And then you look at them offensively every year from 2019 to 2021 with Bryce Purdy, they ranked in uh, in the top 75 or in the top 45 in uh, in overall points scored nationally. So I think this is a solid hire. Coach Satterfield said he wanted to get the staff finalized, set it on signing day, December 21st by January 3rd. We talked about it, us being surprised if we didn't get an offensive coordinator hire by the next time we talked on our show last week. Bing, bang, boom. Right in the nick of time before we start talking, Alex, the Bearcats have a new offensive coordinator along with a couple other coaches who got at it as well. But obviously Tom Manning, the main guy. And now you have Manning at OC, Brian Brown at defensive coordinator, and Kerry Combs at special teams coordinator. I think that's a pretty strong trio of top assistant coaches, which is the number one thing you have to get right if you're a head coach of a big-time college football program is, is getting the best assistance you can. Okay, Russ, you didn't mention this, but, well, you you did. You alluded to it, that he spent time with the Indianapolis Colts. Russ, did yeah. you know, in 2018, when Todd Manning was the tight ends coach for the Colts, guess who led the Colts in touchdown receptions that year? Uh, it was it was it was like a crazy outlier year for like a journeyman. Was it Eric Ebron? Was that who? It was? Yes, yes. Bam. Thirteen Bam. touchdowns. Thirteen touchdowns, Russ, <laughs> on a team who went to the playoffs and played the Chiefs tough. So if you're questioning this hire, look no further than that. And as you mentioned, <laughs> Brees Hall, who we know what he did at Iowa State, and Brock Purdy, and I mean Russ, look what he's doing with the Niners. So it's clear this is a solid. Now, here's what I do ask. And I said this on today's show, and I want your opinion on this. So because we now have seven Louisville staffers joining um, Scott Satterfield at Cincinnati, is there a concern? Like, what's your biggest concern about that? Because, like, I feel like we're now going to see if that coaching staff at Louisville was good and is going to be good at a big time program. Do you have concern about so many Louisville staffers coming with him? Not entirely. I think if it would have gotten to the double digits and you have say all three coordinators being from Louisville, you just have the entire brain trust from Louisville and you don't have this nice mix of former, uh, former staffers staying on because they're either have ties with the program, having played there, Walt Stewart, or having coached there and been a Cincinnati and for a long time, Kerry Coombs mixed in with the Louisville contingent and that lifeblood. I don't have too much concern about that. And to me, honestly, I think the hiring of the staff has been more impressive and I would give it a higher grade than the actual Scott Satterfield hire itself in terms of the kind of outlook and the expectations I have for this staff, this recruiting acumen, and even the off-field staff that you and I haven't even talked about uh, and in large parts over the past couple of weeks, when you think about the first ever general manager being added, bring a guy down from Ohio State, no ties to Louisville and Zach Grant. You get a new director of player personnel, uh, multiple new recruiting staffers in there uh, that we can talk about if we'd like to. But it's, I think, a nice mix of old blood and new blood coming together on the staff. Can confirm these screen beans are very good. Um, So let me ask you this, because I love – that you bring up that point about how your two of your three main coordinators are not from Louisville. And I think it's fine if you're going to bring one, one of your, from- one of your main coordinators, not from Louisville. I, Brian Brown came with him and actually, wait, no, you're right. Duh. I'm an idiot. Tom Manning. Not one of your, one of your, not from yeah. the Louisville tree. True. Yeah. Okay. Continue. So, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is it's okay. If you're going to bring staffers from Louisville, that's fine. That happens at any coaching change. 
But Russ, Todd Manning, or Tom Manning, excuse me, he's been in the Big 12. That should matter, shouldn't it? I think so. He knows how to recruit in this league. He's been recruiting at a, I would say, similar money and investment level at Iowa State as there is at UC. Maybe UC's eventually gets a little bit higher, but Iowa State, obviously an entrenched Big 12 program. They've had a solid track record under Matt Campbell over the past five, six years and a solid recruiting record over that time as well. So I think he's a guy that already can hit the ground running in this conference, knowing what it takes talent-wise in the recruiting living rooms and playing-wise and scheme-wise in the Big 12. And I think fans are immediately going to point that negatively if they want to have a negative attitude about this and be like, oh, well, he was hundred, he was bottom 20 nationally already in the Big 12 with that offense. It's like, well, that's with a dilapidated Iowa State roster that lost, as I mentioned, the top two playmakers from the previous season, and he's not going to be running his offensive scheme in Cincinnati. He's going to be running the Scott Satterfield wide zone, dual threat quarterback, heavy rushing attack laden um, type of offense that is a little bit different from the Iowa State scheme. So I think a new fresh start is probably warranted after he had been with Matt Campbell for over 10 years at this point, roughly 10 years with that one year break with Indianapolis. And to me, he's a guy that I think is, as you mentioned, and that's a great point, has that experience that you need to have access to with all of this coaching turnover and player turnover to hit the ground running in a big step up competition wise right away right away in September or I guess October is when a conference play was start end of September. conference well I mean well I would go to the the game at Pitt on September yeah, the 9th I mean that's that's a big game so um big news that happened as well Lorenz Metz declaring for the NFL draft this you texted me yesterday Bearcats only have now one returning offensive start starter on the offensive line so what does that mean, and what does this hire? Because Todd Manning also coached the offensive line at Iowa State and top 25 rushing attack each the last three years. So, Russ, where does this offensive line sit right now, and how can Todd Manning – am I still pronouncing his name wrong? Um, Tom, how can he – Tommy Manning. Tom. 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 Okay, so you've got <laughs> so you've got the name of the GOAT, and then you've got the name of the, of the GOAT football family in it. Okay. Tom Manning. How ironic yeah, it is that? Yeah, it's kind of crazy how that works. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, okay, there you go. Um, okay, so how does Tom Manning – jeez. Um, how does Tom Manning fix this offensive line at Cincinnati? Through the portal, as we mentioned, Trevor Radisevich already coming in, going to be a strong candidate, all Ivy League guy last year to start on the interior somewhere. Luke Kandra coming in, played – a lot of games at Louisville over the past couple of years, three years of eligibility remaining. He should be a strong candidate to start at one of the tackle spots. And then you got Sidney Fugar coming in for a visit. That's happening as we speak right now, January 4th and 5th, Western Illinois offensive line transfer with three years of eligibility remaining, three-star recruit in the 2021 class he's visiting right now. So it's going to come through the portal. I think that's the number one, and I'd say 1A, 1B, and then a chasm drop off to the other positions of need when you think about wide receiver and offensive line, and then you go down to linebacker and cornerback. Offensive line wise, they just they have Dylan O'Quinn still in the fold. Technically, he has not made an announcement on what his decision will be for uh, the last year of his eligibility remaining out there. He was, I would say, technically a starter last year, but more of a swing guy. Got sent back down uh, to the bench when Lorenz Metz got held late in the year and then ended up stepping in I believe for Jeremy Cooper in the in the bowl game so he's a starter caliber player but not necessarily a returning starter Gavin Gerhardt's the only guy left on there uh going to be a junior uh going into his third year with the program and I, I he's he's a player that wasn't even a starter going into week one when they announced the depth chart following fall camp Jake Fro obviously holding that spot so there's a lot to sift through here. Can you get development out of guys like Ben Blevins? Can D'Artagnan Tinsley be an impact player after transferring uh, over from Kentucky Christian last offseason? Joe Huber on the way out. As I mentioned, you're missing basically both spots on either side of Gavin Gerhardt. How much development can we see out of freshmen, 
sophomores, redshirt freshmen, redshirt sophomores in the spring period, how many of those guys pop. And then I would expect maybe one, at least one more offensive line transfer added here and maybe two more offensive linemen brought in just to make sure they have all their T's crossed and I's dotted on that front. So offensive line, a massive, massive need right now in the transfer portal. And for a full list on who's out of the transfer portal, who has um, uh, decided to declare for the NFL draft, Justin Williams of The Athletic has a great breakdown on that. He keeps it really simple. He's got a full chart on his Twitter page at, I don't even remember his <laughs> Twitter name, even though I'm, I'm, I'm look on up his Twitter Justin like every Williams day. In the search bar. Yes. Let's find it. That's all you have to do. It's at Williams underscore Justin. Thank you, Russ, for keeping things simple on the show. Um, anyway, so – when we return, um, Ivan Pace declared for the NFL draft. We'll get to what that means for a Bearcats linebacker room that Russ, I still think, looks pretty good. Um, little unknown, but if Deshaun Pace stays, I think this it's linebacker key. room is is going to be pretty, pretty set for next year. Um, we'll also get to the hardwood. I mean, Sunday's game, Russ. Whew. Bum, 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 bum. The Bearcats look like they were knocked out at a New Year's Eve party in Philadelphia by the Italian Stallion. I mean, that's how bad it looked um, on su- on Sunday. Uh, big game. And Russ, you wrote a tremendous preview article for tomorrow night's game. We'll get to some points you mentioned there. I will explain all of that after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Bearcats is brought to you by our friends at BetOnline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis, get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season to basketball on the, well, that already happened, the World Cup. We've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest, excuse me, and easiest way to get your betting info. That's the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, thank you for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Lockdown Sports Day, the biggest stories around the war- sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reactions, game recaps, and Lockdown's take of the day. Lockdown Sports Day is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Alex Frank back with you. Lockdown Bearcats, Russ Help, and my colleague at All Bearcats and Sports Illustrated. Russ, um, the other big news from the weekend, I've touched on this on Monday's show, Ivan Pace Jr. declaring for the NFL draft. What does this mean for the linebacker room? Well, obviously, you lose you lose Ty Fawson. Also, he declared for the draft, and you lose Ivan Pace Jr. So you're left with two of your five rotation linebackers from last season. Jaheim Thomas still out there. I believe he's fully committed to coming back and continuing his Bearcats career. And then Deshaun Pace. Will he declare for the NFL draft? I would probably advise him not to do that. He is not a top 650 player on the consensus big board as we speak. I'm going to go ahead and check that, make sure it didn't get updated in the last day or two with him added on there. But I think another year of development could do him really well in this program. And when you think about, I mean, Ty Van Fossen, he's shooting a shot for sure, but I, I hate to say it, but of the 14, I believe 14 Bearcats have declared for the NFL draft. I have three that are on the consensus draft board at all and Javon Hicks, Josh Wiley, and Ivan Pace Jr. Outside of that, those 11 other guys are not even listed among the top 650 prospects. And at this point in the season of the calendar, where we are, it's very unlikely to think that they'll jump into draftable range, which is 250 and above on the big board, by the time we get to those festivities in late April. So maybe, just maybe, a few of those 14 at least a few of those 11, I should say, that don't have draftable uh, outlook right now come back to the program, and we're talking about that over the next couple of months. So how many do you think will come back? Because if only three are on the consensus, what does that say for the other 11 players? That it's it's going to be tough to get on a roster. It's going to be very tough to get drafted. Maybe you get some looks as a college free agent and stuff like that. But I I just, I'm not super convinced that we're going to be getting even half of the nine guys that got drafted last year. It's just, it's just not in the cards. It's not in the projections. And it's, it's not something that 
a lot of uh, a lot of people are, are thinking it's going to happen. Like they they just didn't have the talent this year to warrant that. Despite all these guys declaring for the NFL draft, that is well within their right. If they want to go shoot their shot, shoot the shot. And what am I to tell them any differently? Maybe they do get get picked, and I'm not rooting against them by any means. But I'm uh, I'm here to report, and the reports are the reports. They they are just there's three guys in there. There's 14 that have declared. So something something's going to have to uh, something's going to have to shake out on that front to see whether or not they go all the way in. They stick with their name in the draft. They stick with it, hire an agent, forgo that eligibility, and then become disqualified for college play continuing. Or if they decide to come back for another year with a new head coach on the helm. Is there any news on Deshaun Pace and what he's planning to do? I have not heard a uh, final finalization from Pace or any rumblings. And at this point, I would I would think he would make an announcement if he's going to leave. I don't think he's going to announce if he's going to stay or not because he it's just the timeline tracks that you would not have to make an announcement for that. Uh, but in the next two to three weeks, if he doesn't make a draft de- declaration, I would highly suspect him to stay, uh, stay with the program for another year. I feel like that would be a, a huge retainment by the Bearcats. If you can get a guy who um, coming into last year was your leading returning tackler. And Ivan, obviously, I mean, good for him. For declaring, I mean, after that incredible season, what, 137 tackles, first unanimous Bearcats All-American in program history. Um, it's interesting to think about, though, that there are only three players on the consensus. So it, it, if some players do come back, you'd like to think maybe a guy like Jeremy Cooper or maybe Lorenz Metz, and then your offensive line room all of a sudden looks a lot better on paper than it did, you know, today or yesterday or tomorrow even. So still a lot that needs to be ironed out. Let's talk about the other two assistant coaches named today, Josh Stepp and correct me if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, Greg Gasparato. I think that's right, that yeah. right. Okay. What can you tell us about them? So, so um, Josh, Josh Stepp is a guy that comes over from, from I believe, hold on one second. Let me pull that up real quick. Go in back. For, me for a second, Alex, I was not ready to switch to that. All right, so the Bearcats, um, if you didn't listen to today's show, um, they have named two other assistant coaches, Josh Stepp. He comes over from Georgia State. Uh, he was Louisville's offensive coordinator in the Fenway Bowl, a game where they ran the ball for almost 300 yards. And what I like about this hire is um, Georgia State set numerous records, scoring, touchdowns, total offense, and rushing yards uh, when he was there. Greg Gasparato, defensive um, coach, outside linebackers coach at Louisville. Um, last year, the Cardinals matched a school record with 50 sacks in 13 games. But what I also like is um, he at Army in 2020, a year where the Bearcats played Army in game two of the season, uh, they won a top 25 matchup and they scored 24 points on them. But that Army team was the second best defense in the country, allowing just 14.8 points per game. So tremendous hires, I think. We don't know where Gasparato is going to be just yet. His role has not been determined, but still two really good hires, Russ, right? I would agree. And when you think about Josh Stepp and, and the job he did at Georgia State, it just feels like they're getting a lot of guys with wide-ranging coaching experience, not just position coaching experience. They've handled offense before, and they're going to be able to kind of contribute different aspects of the game plan on either side of the ball. So when you think about step and what he could possibly do with the tight ends if that's what his new role is going to be or whatever he ends up uh manning in this in the staff he has a really great track record at georgia state like you mentioned they set multiple multiple records while he was the the offensive coordinator there most touchdowns 53 in 2019 total offense record 439 yards per game in 2019 241.6 241.6 yards per game in that season as well, setting a new rushing uh, yards per game record at Georgia State. I just think there's a lot of good, solid, foundational brain trust aspects of these hires that are going to, I think, benefit the UC game plan at, game planning throughout the entire season once we get there. You caught me mid-bite in this uh, delicious lunch I have assembled. I can't here, believe so. you're eating lunch right now. This is... <laughs> You said it, okay? Listen. Mm. And I've eaten during shows before. And I don't think there's any rule that you can. Now, should I? Maybe not. But 
I was yeah, hungry. Probably not. <laughs> okay, I'll put this over here. See, no, but this is okay. You said lunch hour, and so I'm at the grocery store. It's tough to host when you got to, food in your mouth. Prior to this show, believe me. Prior to this show, okay, I'm running around buying groceries for my sister, and my mom, and I'm like, hmm, I'm gonna buy myself my lunch. Lunch hour, eat during the show, bingo. All right, but that's for another day. This rice is pretty good though. Um, we'll get to the hardwood next, Russ. Um. There was some good that came out of Thursday, not so good that came out of Sunday. We'll get into that after I explain to everybody about one of my favorite products. See, who needs this lunch when they can talk about a delicious treat without the fat and the calories? You, excuse me, you got to try a Built Bar. So we just got through the holidays, and so my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. Mm, That's a good goal. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then man, I've got the thing for you. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious, you won't think they're good for you, perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes them so good? What makes Built Bar so good, Russ? Well, for starters, they are all covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And when I tell you the unbelievable flavors they come in, I'm talking churro. I love churros. Peanut butter brownie, mm, coconut almond, yes. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar with while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your Built bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. When was the last time you went to Sam's Club, Russ? That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. I can't even tell you the last time I went to Sam's Club. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. Actually, I can tell you. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puffs. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later, BuiltBarBuilt.com. I can actually tell you the last time I went to Sam's Club, but I don't think our viewers want to hear about that. So let's get to the hardwood. Um, By the way, thank you for all who have contributed to the chat. We'll get to those here at the end of the show. Um, So Thursday night, Bearcats beat Tulane. I thought they looked really good. Russ, that was a matchup of the best two offenses in the American Athletic Conference, and the Bearcats looked like a really cohesive team. And then Sunday comes around. Go ahead. If you're going to say something. Yeah, they looked really good, and then they went on the road. (laughs) Yeah, simply put it. Because they – have played two true road games this year. And Russ, Sunday's game was so frustrating to me. And Wes Miller said it after the game. You're not going to win when you get out-rebounded 46-28. to Sorry, you're not. I mean, by Temple. Russ, it's not like they're playing Houston. They're playing Temple. Years ago, you're from Cincinnati, you know this. Years ago, this team would own the Owls. Now they are 0-3 under them under West Miller. What is going on with that? Like, Russ, what happened on Sunday? What stood out to you as to why this team is now back in the, well, they can't rebound. Well, they, they, they can't score when it matters. They can't win on the road. They're inconsistent. Russ, what stands out to you from Sunday? They can't get boards on the road. They did, the, the rebounding that is solid at home, that's stable, that's palpable, that's palatable, I should say, and that allows your offense to stay in the flow and to stay in the rhythm of games just doesn't seem to be there on the road. At home, 51% rebounding rate overall as a team. That drops to 44% on the road this season in two contests. They have now had two road games where they've allowed career highs in rebounding to players six foot eight or smaller. And uh, I forget who the guy's name was at, at Northern Kentucky, but he was, he's an amazing rebounder in his own right. That's not There's no shame in letting him get 14, 15, 16 boards. That happens uh, every now and then. It's happened pretty regularly in his career. But to give up 16 rebounds to a guy like Jalil White, like that just cannot happen. The, the box outs have to get better. Victor Locken needs to be a little bit more disciplined. His growth has been amazing this year, but the fouling on the road can't happen. He cannot get into foul trouble late in the in first halves, 
late in possessions like he had like he did on Sunday against Temple. It destroyed the offensive rhythm of this team. They went on or gave up a 15 nothing run after going up 27 20 on a deep deep three from Jeremiah Davenport to kind of give them even more cushion. And then the defense wasn't awful, but the rebounding just wasn't there. There were possessions, Alex. I can think I counted three possessions where the uh, the Owls got three offensive rebounds on the same possession. And one and two of the times they kicked them out for threes. It's just possessions like that are back breaking. It's like when you go the length of a field on an NFL drive, get to the one yard line, go for it four times and not get it. It's just demoralizing. It demoralizes a defense. And it's something that they obviously have to get fixed. And I don't know that there's any huge fix for this besides just wanting to rebound, being in better box out position and just playing more focused on the road in these road environments. They have also yet to come back from a halftime deficit this season. 0-5 when trailing at the half. We all remember the big storm back against Xavier, but anytime you're down 17 against a team as good as Xavier that just took out the number two team in the country in UConn this past weekend, you're going to have a hard time pulling off that full-on comeback. So to me, it just has to be a little bit more focus on the rebounding end to make sure that you're not getting into these lulls offensively that they find themselves in. When things are cooking great, like you said, they're the number one offensive team in the AAC for a reason. Their offensive flow is fantastic on most games, most stretches, most possessions. But when the other team starts to feel that pressure from the glass, starts to use that to their advantage, you see can't get their defense set as quickly. They can't get in their, their offensive actions as quickly because they're not getting the ball moving up the floor fast because they're not rebounding. And that, to me, is the heart of everything. There's a reason Wes Miller, and there's a reason I bring up Wes Miller, bringing up rebounding as his number one thing, first thing he looks at when he looks at the box score, and the first thing he seems to bring up every single press conference. And that was on full display Sunday afternoon for a team that cannot afford to let their one one lone reliable front court player get in foul trouble. We saw what happens. Oh yeah. I mean, Victor Lockin only had four rebounds. Odio Guama led the team with five. I mean, but that shouldn't be the case every night. And I think about Russ too. Like as soon as this team gets, forget about them a halftime deficit. As soon as this team is behind, they panic. What do they not do? They don't rebound. They don't, you know, move the ball. They take bad shots. This team, it, when everything's going well, they do a lot of things well. When adversity sets in, that's when this team folds, and that's not a characteristic of a great Bearcats basketball team, as we've seen in years past. I remember Russ four years ago. Mick Cronin took a Bearcats team in a temple. They trailed by 14. They were getting outplayed. You know what they did? They came back and won. Why? Oh, maybe because the rebound was the rebound margin was 47-22 to 22 in the Bearcats' favor. This team is not like that team. This team shows a lot of fight. This team shows a lot of you know exciting things, but when – they get down, and it's not like they're playing Memphis. It's not like they're playing Temple. It's not like they're playing in a road environment where there's 12,000 fans. No. Russ, how many fans were at the game on Sunday? Maybe 2,500 because they were all maybe. still sleeping from New Year's Eve. Yeah, maybe. Key word. Maybe. So <laughs> this is a this is a um this is a very, very um uh pivotal stre- pivotal point in the season. Now, tomorrow the Bearcats take on Wichita State and if on you the road that- again. On the road, and I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a lot tougher environment. I, I, we know what that environment's like. Uh, the roundhouse. Uh, when Wichita State is good, when Wichita State is, I mean, when they were in their 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 heyday, uh, just a few years ago, that you did not want to play at Charles Cook Arena, the roundhouse. It's a very very difficult place to play. Um, that's a very passionate fan base out there. So. You wrote it in your preview, Craig Porter, the player to watch, but it's their defense that could give the Bearcats problems. Russ, can you elaborate? Just really no issues specifically for this Wichita State team. And they have no identifiable weaknesses. When you think about top to bottom, led by Craig Porter, seen Craig Porter, he is a fantastic on-ball guard defender, has the number one defensive rating on the team, only allowing about 88.1 points per 100 possessions when he is on the floor, 11.9 points per game, 5.7 rebounds, 3.8 assists, has a team-high 1.98 defensive BPR rating on EvanMaya.com. Like, this guy is a sound, sound defensive player. 1.6 steals per game, 3.2% steal rate, really, really good. And when you think about Wichita State defensively, 
29th in scoring allowed per game. They hold teams to the 14th lowest field goal percentage nationally, 42.4%. 28.4% three-point percentage allowed this season, 26th nationally. Going up against a team in Cincinnati that's top 50 nationally in three-point attempts per game, that's going to be a big bellwether and a big something's got to give matchup on Thursday night. I am very interested to see how UC's guards, Jeremiah Davenport, Landers Nolly, Mike Adams Woods, David DeJulius, how that backcourt deals with Craig Porter and the rest of these kind of just Hornet-like Wichita State guards. That's a huge matchup to me. And a big matchup and a big thing I'm looking for in this game is Landers Nolly. He's been fantastic this year. We haven't talked about him a whole lot on this show. I would say he has kind of picked up some of the slack that Rob Fennessy, not on his own, not his fault, he got injured. But Kalu Zikpe has been a disaster transfer. And Landers Nolly has almost made up for all three of their impacts in this season with how efficient he's been, shooting career highs in true shooting, effective field goal rate, has a career high in three-point percentage. And that's where my next point takes me. Jeremiah Davenport is playing better this season. You could argue he's playing the best basketball he's played in a Bearcats uniform leaving aside shooting the bat, shooting the ball, which is obviously a big thing. But the caveat remains, he is leading this team, Alex, in three-point shots. That just cannot continue. It cannot continue. He cannot continue to be six shots from outside higher than Landers Nolly. The man is shooting 29% from outside. Landers Nolly is shooting 42% from outside and the 42% shooter is not leading the team in attempts. It's mind-blowing. Jeremiah Davenport has been, I think, fun, more fun to watch this year. He's taken less terrible shots, but he's still taken two to three. Just make your head explode early shot clock heaves throughout each and every game. And those need to go down to one or zero in a, in a, in a hurry because offensively, this team could have an even higher ceiling if the right players were taking the right amount of shots. Well, I get out the hot take, the hot take chain that your friend James Rapine, our boss, uh, had on ESPN 1530. Because I feel like a lot of people are, are questioning your take there on Jeremiah Davenport. Because I mean, I talk to people I know and I work with at Bearcast Media, and they told me like they, I mean, he's frustrating them. And you know, well, as yeah, you he's say, frustrating me too. I don't think it was a hot take. I said he's playing good basketball besides shooting. Yeah, which is what's happening. Okay, he's, he's okay. He's play, he's Whoa. playing decent besides shooting the ball, which he shoots way too much. It's interesting because like you said he's playing better this year than last year. And, yep. okay, maybe that's because he doesn't have to take on a large role because the Julius is so good. You got Landers Nolly. So, you know, you bring up a lot of interesting points there. I just think he if he's playing well, this team is better. If he's not and the Bearcats lose, you're always going to point to, well, see, we told you, you know, he takes too many bad shots. So, it's kind of like to me, and we're getting to the point here. It's like he's a polarizing player, isn't he? Oh yeah, Jeremiah Davenport is easily the most polarizing player on the on the team, and it's it's he 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 does it to himself. Let's be honest. Like he, yeah. he goes out there and heaves up those prayer shots that he's hitting. Like I mentioned, twenty nine percent of the time, it's just the the juice is not worth the squeeze on terms of shot difficulty and the impact those difficult shots are having on this offense. I don't think, I mean, that's definitely not a hot take. Everybody in Bearcat Nation is, I, I think, on board with that. Everybody in the media is on board with that. We talk about it during the games uh, all the time, how it's just, we'll look around at each other when there's one of those head-scratching shots, and everybody listening to this knows exactly what I'm talking about. As we sit here today, it is 109. If you're listening to the live room, if you're listening to it on podcast form, it's Thursday. Bengals head coach Zach Taylor getting ready to speak to the media, Russ, you were watching the game Monday night. I was there. Um, very, very scary situation with what happened uh, to Buffalo Bills defensive back Demar Hamlin. Um, and obviously, he is very still, still very much in our thoughts and prayers. What, yep. um, Russ, is your take? It, 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 what are you just what? I mean, what was your reaction to Monday night and what happened? And what are your thoughts right now? 
I mean, I don't want to keep beating this over the head. Like everybody knows what my thoughts are. Everybody kind of feel like has the same thoughts. It was awful. It was horrific. It's something you never want to see. And obviously I've been reporting on it at all Bengals over the last two days. Everybody and their mother has been reporting on it over the last two or three days. I think everybody understands the situation now. We are praying, hoping that the Mar Hamlin comes out of this thing completely, 100% the same man that he was going in to kick off on Monday Night Football. And outside of that, I don't think there's really anything else that needs to be said. Well said. Let's end on a positive and get to the chat. Um, Let's see. We don't really have um, a lot of questions. Don't really have a question in the chat today. That's true. Um. Yeah, I don't really have a lot. Well, that's okay. Um, Next week, drop your questions, people. We'll end. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Russ, thank you as always. Um, best wishes to you and your family. Happy New Year to you, and Happy New Year to all of you listening. And uh, we'll get back at it next week. 2023, big year for all Bearcats and Locked On Bearcats. Can't wait for Correct. it. Correct. should be fun. Correct. Correct. All right, Russ Heldman, my colleague at All Bearcast and Sports Illustrated, joining me today here on Lockdown Bearcats. As for me, you can follow me on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty. I'm on Instagram, Alex Frank and underscore, and email alex 3 frank at gmail.com. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen today. Now make Lockdown Sports today your second listen. Peter Bukowski brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes. Get the analysis and opinions before anyone else with our local and national experts and insiders. Lockdown Sports Today podcast available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. I'm Alex Frank for Lockdown Bearcats. Have a great rest of your day. Please keep Damar Hamlin. Continue to keep him and his family in your thoughts and prayers. And I'll be back here on Friday right here in Lockdown Bearcats, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.